Well, we're entering the final major section of the book of Ezekiel. And from 40 to the end is, deals with this strange period called the millennium. And tonight we're going to try to bite off about three chapters of that, which are primarily descriptive. But uh, the millennium, this is a very controversial topic among contemporary theologians. And, uh, but this, this period called the millennium was promised to David and, uh, and even, uh, God even put himself under oath in Psalm 89 over the issue. And this is predicted not just in Revelation chapter 20, all through the Old Testament, all through the Psalms and the prophets. And I won't go even iterate them, they'll be in your notes of course. This was also promised to Mary by Gabriel. We celebrate that every Christmas, that her child was to sit on the throne of David. And that was also reaffirmed to the apostles in Luke 22 and elsewhere. When we speak of the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come. And I suspect that nine out of ten people who quote that have no idea what they're talking about. That's, this is what we're talking about, Thy kingdom come. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And of course, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are centered on this whole idea of Christ ruling as, with a rod of iron before whom every knee shall bow. That's what we're talking about here. The millennium. The creation apparently is changed dramatically. That's described in Zechariah and Isaiah in great detail. Most of what we know about the millennium comes from Isaiah 65, not from Revelation 20. The curse apparently, at least in some sense, seems to be lifted in Isaiah 11. The creation itself has been redeemed. Not finally or completely, but substantially. And the earth, the whole planet earth, is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord in Isaiah 11 and Habakkuk 2. Yet, don't get confused, this is not eternity yet. It's a very, in fact, the more you study the millennium, the more questions it raises. There is death and sin. Each is going to have land, and it'll be fruitful. That's not heaven, that's something else, okay? This is not heaven. N nor is it what's called the eternal state that follows. Because after Revelation 20 comes Revelation 21 and 22. Very different. In some respects, easier to answer questions about that than the millennium. And this is not the new earth. People talk about, what, how do you feel about global warming? Boy, it's coming. Not by those faulty models that people are using for political reasons. No, no, no. Peter, it's going to burn. Burn, baby, burn, I guess. All right. And it's not, it's not where righteousness dwells, and there's a limited amount of evil, and it's, but it's judged immediately. There's death for unbelievers only in Isaiah 65. Nowhere is there any resurrection of millennial saints. That's a strange bit here. The tribulation saints complete the first resurrection according to Revelation 20. Wow. There are apparently no Jewish unbelievers according to Jeremiah 31. Think about that one. All of these may have some theological exceptions, but that's, that's the flavor of the text. And apparently everyone accepts by their hundredth year. So apparently, you know, <laughs> there's hope for all of us. No, I, I, and as death only among Gentiles. There are the, some of these ideas you'll find among the uh, scholars, because uh, millennial it, it raises more questions than, than you realize. But there are unconditional covenants in the Scripture. There's a number of covenants. There are four primary unconditional covenants. The Abrahamic covenant being uh, primary. Every one of us, whether we're Jewish or not, if we're in Christ, are beneficiaries of the Abrahamic covenant. Then, of course, there's the land covenant. Both of those covenants are under attack by the world. The Abrahamic covenant is attacked strangely by some churches. The land covenant is certainly attacked by Islam, if not the world in general. Then we have this overlooked one. Many Christian churches overlook the fact that the Davidic covenant is an unconditional covenant. And then, of course, there's the everlasting covenant in Jeremiah 31. But it's this Davidic covenant I want to focus on for a moment. Because it's, let's take a look at it in 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7. Nathan's instructed by God, he says, Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcote, 
from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. No surprise so far. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. No surprise so far. God continues, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Really? Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be ruled over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers... He's speaking to David. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Is he talking about Solomon? I don't think so. The throne of his kingdom. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. That's the Davidic covenant. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. The two houses of Israel, they had a civil war when Solomon died. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Northern kingdom went to idol worship, wiped out. Southern kingdom was worse than the northern kingdom and had their example to follow and ignored it. Why weren't they wiped out? No, they were just sent to Babylon for 70 years. For one reason, because of God's promise to David. Not because the southern was better than the north. They were both in bad shape. Anyway, um, we'll get, won't go down that, all that stuff. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. That's quite a while. And so. And when you have Christmas cards, we all remember, in, you always get, see Christmas cards every year with Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Those aren't the same thing. A child is born as human, the son is given as divine. The dual nature there. Woo-wee. And the government shall be what? Upon his shoulder. When was it on his shoulder? Not so you'd notice. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But don't stop there. Pick up verse 7, where it continues, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, which did not exist during Christ's ministry, upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The throne of David, there it is again. Don't miss that. That's not the Father's throne. And Luke chapter 1, Gabriel visiting Mary, announcing the birth saying, speaking of her child, he shall be great, he shall be called the son of the highest. Wow. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Boy, that must be an empty promise, or something big is yet to happen. The throne of his father David. Has that happened yet? No. Will it? Yes. Many, many churches don't think so. Well, that's just an allegory. Well, we'll see. Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. A few verses later, then shall the King say unto Him on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, there's that word again, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The throne of His glory, that's quite a throne. The kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Wow! from the foundation of the world. Well, from here you can get into a whole story of when it was lost. Prior to Noah's flood was the second flood. The first flood is between... Anyway, we won't, get, we won't go into that here. Let's move on. Council for Jerusalem. The biggest event in the book of Acts. Okay, Jesus crucified, dead, resurrected. We're now in the book of Acts. The big event in the book of Acts is this debate about Gentiles and Jews and so forth. 
And James, the chairing that council, quoting, he, he, he answers their issues by saying, Simeon, Simon, had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, remember Acts 10 and the sheet and all that, to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophet as it is written. And James quotes from Amos 9, verse 11 and 12. He's quoting uh, from, that, from the Old Testament. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Again, you know, it's the tabernacle of David. So, the throne of David will be reestablished in Jerusalem. Not in, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, or Washington, D.C., no, Jerusalem. And this was also emphasized to Abraham back in Genesis 17. And who's going to rule? David. Four times it says David's the one that's going to rule. Now some people say, well, he means the son of David. And they might be right, but I'm more and more figure God can express himself quite clearly, and he certainly has. And by the way, none of this can be applied to the church. We covered that when we were in Ezekiel 37 a couple of, a couple of sessions ago. This is also going to include, among other things, some profound changes on the earth. We want to be sensitive to that as we get into some details here. Remember back in Ezekiel 37, we read, David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. David my servant shall be king. I thought he died. Yes. Is he going to be resurrected? Yes. Oh, that could get exciting. When is all this going to happen? Jesus tells us that in Hosea. Jesus says, I will go and return to my place. In order to return, he had to leave it. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. It's interesting, as we study the Gospels, there's something that should be called to your attention. Mark, Luke, and John all talk about the kingdom of God. But Matthew uses a strange expression, and only he uses it. In many of the stories that are similar, Matthew speaks of the kingdom of heaven. 739 references to it, by the way. Matthew, 33 times, says the kingdom of heaven. Some people say, well, he's just Jewish. He used that phrase as an equivalent phrase. No. Five times he used the word kingdom of God. It's my position that he is being more denotative that he's dealing with a, obviously, the kingdom of God includes everything outside God himself. Includes all his uh, creation, even before the earth. Angels and whatever. The kingdom of heaven, kingdom from heaven, incidentally, is a specific kingdom that he deals with throughout the scriptures. So we'll take a look at this. And is he talking about a kingdom as you and I think of it? Absolutely. When you get to Daniel 2, you saw the whole lineup of all the different Babylon, uh, uh, per, uh, Persia, Greece, Rome, and so forth. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the, the kingdom that shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The climactic event of Nebuchadnezzar's image, the many metals, is a kingdom that God is going to set up on the earth. That means it has a capital, it has a king, it's a literal place on the earth. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom, and the word here is used in, con- in the concert of the other three. Well, why a temple? Okay, that's so much for the millennium. Now we're, getting, we're going to get right into... into uh, Ezekiel's temple. Why a temple? Ezekiel was told to reveal these plans to the people in order to make them ashamed of their sins and rebellions. So it's, it's a, their, their temple had been destroyed, right? He's pointing to a future day when there's going to be a, an elaborate temple to get them to be ashamed of their sins. The regulations we're going to see in chapters 40 through 48 are intended for a regenerated people. People overlook that. There's a long way to go from where they are now to where they're going to have to be before that temple is in operation. 
Another observation that's worth making, no prophet speaking under God's authority ever uttered a false pr prediction. That's what Deuteronomy 18 is all about. So here's a prophet, Ezekiel, making some very specific predictions. He's got the size of the doorways, and the thickness of the walls, and on and on and on. Is he wrong? Is he just impressionable? Are these just his opinions? I don't think so. The climax to the rest, their, reg, their registration as a nation will come when God's glory re-enters the new temple in Jerusalem. We saw it leave back there in Ezekiel 11. We're going to see it return in the next session when we go into chapter 43. So the millennial temple, we have a description of this temple. It's highly detailed. One reason it's detailed is that you can't make it symbolic. It doesn't make sense. All nations, not just Israel, all nations are going to worship there. Wow. Offerings and sacrifices are resumed, and that gives a lot of people heartbreak, heart, 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 you know, heartburn. We'll talk about that next time, by the way. But here's something the church might consider a little bit. The temple, when it's in operation, is only open on Saturday, not Sunday. It's only open on Shabbat and the new moon. That's very Jewish in its procedures. Interesting. Well, let's take a quick snapshot and refresh ourselves about architecture. You remember the tabernacle had a linen fence. It was about 75 feet wide and 150 feet long, if I accept, uh, you know, 10 cubits uh, as a uh, foot and a half cubit kind of thing. And uh, so the total length being, incidentally, the length of Noah's Ark, but who cares? Let's go here. We, you enter one gate and you come to the brazen altar. Altar of sacrifice, then there's a laver for washing, and then you get to the naos, the temple proper, consisting of a holy place and the holy of holies. Let's take a look at that part a little more clearly so we have the architecture in our mind. Okay, you have the holy place and the holy of holies. You have the menorah, that, uh, the, the, the seven-branched uh, lampstand. You have the table of showbread, 12 loaves, one for each tribe. And then you have the golden altar, for the altar of incense, don't, not to be confused with the brazen altar outside. And you have the Ark of the Covenant, and you have some, another piece on top of it, separate, called the mercy seat. We tend to lump them together, but they're always described separately. And each one of these things are something that Jesus made, laid claim to. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, we're told. He says, I am the door. Anyone that comes through by, by, by me is a thief and a robber. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I, he makes inter, the, the, uh, incense being intercession for us. He's our sin bearer, and of course he's our propitiation, the mercy seat. Wow. Okay. Well, after the tabernacle, of course, we get to Solomon, and Solomon did his temple, and then, of course, the, after that gets destroyed, we have the second temple, as it's called. That causes confusion. We have the first temple by Solomon. Then after the Babylonian captivity, Nehemiah comes back, and they build it again. Some years later, Herod, to try to popularize himself to the people, a non-Jew, by the way, an Edomian, he uh, remodels it, expands it. You and I would tend to look at that as the third temple. But that's not the way uh, scholarship deals with it. It's widely, the t second temple is a Nehemiah temple, even though it was expanded and modernized by Herod. It's still called the second temple. Don't let that confuse you. Okay, take a look at this. We have the, holy, the same familiar architecture, the Holy of Holies. But in, in here we have, instead of a table and a menorah, we have ten of them, because Solomon has expanded it greatly. Then you have the inner court. You have the Holocaust altar, as it's called, and the molten sea is replacing the labor. So the, the recognizable elements here. You have an outer court and an inner court. And you have a porch with two, two uh, um, pillars, Yachin and Boaz, that don't hold up anything, but they have names, and you want to understand what they're for. And then you have the strange personal storage areas for the priests. The, and uh, if you want to understand how these things uh, affect you, I encourage you to take a look either at our briefing package called The Architecture of Man, or better yet, my wife's publications deals with this in terms of its practical application for our lives. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Now Ezekiel's temple, now having that background, is the Ezekiel description historical? Is, does it fit the original temple? No. Does it fi fit Nebu uh, um, ne um, Nehemiah's temple? No. 
Does it fit uh, uh, Herod's remodeling that? No. So it, people have tried to make it sort of approximate history, and you, it, it, it's contri it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's just so different. Well, maybe it's the temple that's going to be rebuilt. We know the temple's going to be rebuilt because the Antichrist is going to desecrate it. We know it's standing by the middle of the 70th week of Daniel. Is that that temple? No, it has no resemblance there at all. Is it possibly a fourth? Or is it just allegorical? Many scholars try to just make it an allegory. Or does it apply to the church? Boy, you talk about doing contortions. Um, I'm always reminded by the, in the computer industry, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. Um, no, we told the position that this is a fourth temple. This is a temple that will be built after the destruction of the one that, that the Antichrist uh, messes up. The Millennial Temple. It's going to consist of three terraces, the highest of which facing east stands the temple and its annexes, then the temple yard, and the large building directly behind it. We'll come to that. The middle terrace are kitchens and chambers for the priests, and a court containing the altar of burnt offering, and the inner courts with three elaborate porticos. Then the lowest terrace, surrounded by an exterior wall, contains the outer courts with three porticos and kitchens and chambers for the people. That's the broad brush treatment. Let's take a look at it. I'm tr I'm tr uh, before I had east at the bottom, which is the normal way you present these things, but it's more practical for me to turn it on the side of the direction we're going. So east is now over on our right-hand end, okay? And so you recognize the basic architecture from before. But we're going to add some um, portions here. We've got chambers for singers that are going to be added there. And we have a couple of other places here, priest chambers uh, there. And then we have uh, priest kitchens back here. So this is still priesthood um, uh, committed here, okay? But we go on a little bit larger now, the next terrace. We have the inner gates, and uh, then we add the outer gates. So these are, visualize these as th three primary terraces, okay? And then around the uh, outer gates, we have chambers of the outer court, and we also have kitchens for the peoples. So the outer court, that level, is people, kitchens and chambers and what have you. And up a level are the priest levels, and then, of course, you've got the temple proper. Okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about these uh, outer gates. The same word in the Septuagint that's outer there is also speaking of the darkness that's outside. And one of the great debates you'll get into when you get in the, in the especially in the Gospel of Matthew, is what is this darkness outside? Number of conjectures, it could be as simple as those that are not allowed inside the temple part itself. No more than that. There's a, there's a tendency when you say that outer darkness, that must mean uh, Gehenna. No, that's not what it's talking about. Anyway, moving on here. Let's just jump into Ezekiel 40, verse 1. In the 5 and 20th year of the captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the 10th day of the month, and because it's the 10th day, some people think this may, some scholars think this may have been a jubilee year, but that's speculative. In the 14th year after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day that the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel talking, and he brought me thither. Jerusalem has been destroyed, the temple's been burned, but Ezekiel is being shown a temple. He's being transported forward in time here. That, that, uh, it'll, be the, it'll be the city during the millennium kingdom. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain, which was as the, fl the, the uh, frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, and a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood at the gate. He's, 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 like, he's like bright brass. This is typically the way the messengers appear several places in Daniel and elsewhere. The line of flax apparently is for measuring long measurements, and the reed for shorter measurements, okay? The Hebrew cubit, by some experts, believe it was 17, 5, 8 inches. It was the, from the tip of your finger to the elbow. And nominally, we use 18 inches. It's close enough for our purposes. The reed was about 10 and a third feet long, by the way. It was used for longer measures, okay? You have a cubit, which is the 18 inches. You have a cubit and a span, a span being the width of your hand. If you add that to it, you get the, an extra three inches. And so there's a lot of debate. Are we dealing with regular cubits or long cubits? And that's a couple of inches difference, but we're not going to spend any time on that. We'll just adopt the conventional assumption, which is call it 18 inches. 
We're only off at half an inch, and that's close enough. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. So we're now going to start in the outer court. That's from verses 5 through 47, uh, to 27 of this chapter. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about in the man's hand, a measuring uh, reed of six cubits long by the cubit, and a hand breadth. There's the long cubit. See the six cubits long by the cubit and a hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. You're talking ten feet high, ten and a half feet kinds of things. Then came he unto the gate which looketh toward the east, and went up the stairs thereof, and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad. It's a double gate, apparently. The east gate was to be especially sacred, because that was the gate through which the glory of God had departed back there in Ezekiel 11. Remember that? And it's also the gate through which it's going to return in the next chapter. I mean, chapter 43, the next session. And every little chamber was one reed long and one reed broad, and between the little chambers were five cubits, and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate within was one reed. He measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. He measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits, and the post thereof two cubits, and the porch of the gate was inward. Are you following all this? Are you sketching it down? And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side, and three were of one measure, and the posts had one measure on this side and on that side, and he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate ten cubits and the length of the gate thirteen cubits. The space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side, and the space was one cubit on that side, and the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. By the way, this is confusing enough just trying to get it in English. We're ignoring the problems in the Hebrew which make it even a little more complicated. There's more that scholars can argue over. We're going to spare you all that. He measured them the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of the other, and the breadth was five and twenty cubits, the door against door. And he made also the posts of three score cubits, even unto the post of the court round about the gate. Now whatever else, whether you're following the details or not, you do get the impression he's talking about something Tangible and specific. It's a vision, yes, but it's tangible as far as he's concerned. Okay. And from the face of the gate of the entrance unto the face of the porch of the inner gate was fifty cubits. And there were narrow windows to the little chambers and to their posts within the gate round about, and likewise to the arches. And the windows were round about inward, and upon each post were palm trees. Well, here's a sketch by some. I'm taking this from the Bible Knowledge Commentary because they went through their... The, and, this, and here the dimensions on, the, on, the, on their chart is in feet to give you, uh, you know, something you can relate to. It has it roughly 90 uh, feet long, and this is one of the gates of the temple. Well, there are several of them. We'll take a look at it when we do the master plan. But uh, the, the, little, the little alcoves there are up for, apparently for guards. Then there's a portico, steps, thresholds, and the little windows on the side. So that's, that's the uh, gateway to the temple. Okay. And, and, and some of this is taken from the next chapter, too. This is a composite, if you will. Moving on, verse 17. Then brought he me into the outward court, and lo, there were chambers, and a pavement made for the court round about. Thirty, cha thirty chambers were upon the pavement. And the pavement by the side of the gates, over and against the length of the gates, was lower, was the lower pavement. Now, the use for, of these rooms is not stated. But they may have been storage rooms, or they may have been meeting rooms for people when they celebrated their feasts, which is the more likely thing in my mind. And uh, then he measured the breadth from the forefront of the lower gate to the forefront of the inner gate without, and a hundred cubits eastward and northward. And the gate of the outward court that looked toward the north, he measured the length thereof and the breadth thereof. So from the inside lower gateway to the outside of the inner court, that is the threshold of the gate leading to the inner court, was 175 feet, or a hundred cubits if you will, okay? And the little chambers thereof were three on this side and three on that side, and the posts thereof and the arches thereof were after the measure of the first gate, and the length thereof was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. And their windows and arches and their palm trees were after the measure of the gate that looked toward the east, and they went up unto it by seven steps, and the arches thereof were before them. It's seven here, it's going to be eight layer, because the seven plus the eight Eight's a little more holy than seven is complete, but eight's the new beginning. But the seven plus the eight are the steps of ascent in the uh, Psalms of ascent, by the way, as an aside. 
And the gate of the inner court was over against the gate of the, toward the north and the toward the east, and measured from the gate to gate a hundred cubits. And after he brought me toward the south, and behold, a gate toward the south, and he measured the post thereof and the arches thereof according to these measures, and there were windows in it, and in the arches thereof round about, like those windows, the length was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. I've sort of assumed by giving you the overview starting, some of this, you can get a feeling where it would fit in. I'm, I didn't want to take our time to build it inch, inch, by, inch by inch here. Continuing, there are seven steps to go up to it, and the arches thereof were before them, and it had palm trees on this side, and another on, another on that side, upon the post thereof. And there was a gate in the inner court toward the south, and he measured from gate to gate toward the south a hundred cubits. Well, that's the outer court. Ready for the inner court? Okay. This is verses 28 to 47 here. And he brought me to the inner court by the south gate, and he measured the south gate according to these measures, and the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, the arches thereof, according to these measures. And there were windows in it, and in the arches thereof, round about, and it was fifty cubits long, and five and twenty cubits broad. And the arches round about were five and twenty cubits long, and five cubits broad. The arches thereof were toward the utter the utter court, and the palm trees were upon the posts thereof, and the going up to it had eight steps. Seven, four, now it's eight. Okay, fifteen total. And he brought me into the inner court toward the east, and he measured the gate according to these measures, and the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof were according to these measures, and there were windows therein, and the arches thereof round about, and it was fifty cubits long, and five and twenty cubits broad. The arches thereof were toward the outward court, and the palm trees were upon the post thereof, on this side and on that side, and the going up to it had eight steps. And he brought me to the north gate, and measured it according to these measures. The little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, and the windows to it, round about, the length was fifty cubits, breadth five and twenty. The posts thereof were toward the utter court, and the palm tr trees were upon the posts thereof, on this side, on that side, and going up to an eight step. So you have, you have the, the, the uh, east, north, south, you've got the each steps repeated Literally. So this is a quick snapshot. Again, uh, the view, you'll, you'll find different scholars have slightly different renderings. They're all very similar. They all have their subtle differences. Um, they have the, uh, the altar there is in the middle of the inner court. Yeah, uh, you have a building that's not explained we'll talk about up on the west side. That's on the top side of the diagram here. But nobody knows what that's for. I'll come back to that. But you've got the, you've got the outer gates and the inner gates showing here, on the east, north, and south sides. And uh, so it's a three-sided access here. And there are kitchens and all that, as we've talked about before. And so that's pretty, and the dimensions on the diagram are in feet, to give a feeling for that. Okay? Continuing, the chambers and the entries thereof were by the posts of the gates, which were where they washed the burnt offering and, oops, offerings. We're going to get all hung up on offerings here pretty soon, but let's go ahead. And in the porch of the gate were two tables on this side and two tables on that side to slay thereon the burnt offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering. Classic three, burnt, sin, and trespass, three different offerings. Some obligatory, some voluntary. Now, in verses 39 to 42, it implies that they are reinstating the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. We're going to review all that, that whole issue when we get to chapter 45. So we'll postpone it now. We'll talk a little bit about it so you're not bothered by it. But the offerings in the millennium will have the same effect the offerings of the past did. The offerings of the past did not wash away sin. They were pointers to the cross before the fact. These offerings are pointing to the cross after the fact. In both cases, the only thing that has effect, is effective for sin is the cross that the Lord died on. These other things are memorials. They will be doing memorials, memorial sacrifices, the same way we in the church today celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a commemoration. Anyway, going on here. And the side without, as one goes to the entry of the north gate, were two tables. On the other side, which was at the porch, the gate were two tables. Four tables were on this side, four tables on that side. By the side of the gate, eight tables, whereupon they slew their sacrifices. And the four tables were of hewn stone for the burnt offering, of a cubit and a half long, and a cubit and a half broad, and a cubit high. Whereupon they laid the instruments wherewith they slew the burnt offering and the sacrifice. So the whole issue of sacrifice bothers a lot of people. A lot of people think, well, they, they don't mean that literally. Well, see, first of all, animal sacrifices never took away human sin. Only the sacrifice of Christ can do that. 
Hebrews 10 hammers that. In the Old Testament time, Israelites were saved by grace through faith. And the sacrifice helped restore a believer's fellowship with God. But it wasn't that sacrifice, it was Christ's sacrifice uh, uh, that paid the price. Second point is, even after the church began, Jewish believers did not hesitate to take part in the temple worship. Acts chapter 2, 3, 5. And even to offer sacrifice in Acts 21. They could do this because they viewed the sacrifice as memorials of Christ's death. That was their view. That'll be the same viewpoint that'll uh, apparently pertain during the millennium. The millennial sacrifices, however, will differ from the Levitical sacrifices in some surprising ways. We won't get into here, we'll get into it later. We're going to review these in chapter 45. But there are similarities, and there's a number of other passages in the Bible, in Isaiah 56 and 66, Jeremiah 33, Zechariah 14, Malachi 3, that allude to sacrifices in the millennium. So this is not unique to Ezekiel's rendering here. Let's continue in verse 43. And within were hooks and a hand broad and fastened round about, and upon the tables was the flesh of the offering, and without the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court, which was at the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south, one at the side of the east gate having the prospect toward the north. And he said to me, This chamber, whose prospect is toward the south, is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. And these are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister to him. Now this whole issue of Zadok, a little history here, he, like, if you, in order to be a priest, you had to be a descendant of Aaron. But the priesthood was then conferred specifically to Zadok because he had set aside... Uh, 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 David set aside the, the uh, family of Ithmar because of the part that Abiathar had taken in the rebellion of Adonijah. When Adonijah had his rebellion, um, Ithamar's family was, joined the wrong team. And so at this point, Zadok is, is uh, singled out, and it's his descendants then that become the priests. So you didn't, you had to be not just descended from Aaron, you had to be a descendant of Zadok to be a priest. That's the point. Well, that apparently continues in the, in the millennium is the point. Okay, verse 47, he measured the court 100 cubits long and 100 cubits broad, four square, and the altar that was before the house. Now, that's not to be con confused with the court of Israel, which is open to all, and uh, on the three sides of the territory. This, this court was 100 cubits square and had an altar on it in front of the temple. Now the temple building itself, verses 48 through uh, chapter 41. The temple, that's the temple proper. We're zeroing in on it specifically. And it looks pretty familiar in terms of the architecture that we're used to all the way through here. He brought me to the porch of the house and measured each porch, post of the porch, five cubits um, on this side, five cubits on that side, and the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. And uh, these two verses, this one and the next one, really belong to the next chapter, where this is all going to be taken up. Okay. The length of the porch was 20 cubits, and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me by the steps whereby they went up to it. And there were pillars by the posts, one on this side and the other on that side. I assume they might have the same mains, Yachin and Boaz, but it doesn't say it, I don't think. Afterward, he brought me to the temple and measured the posts. Six cubits broad on the one side, six cubits broad on the other side, which was the breadth of the tabernacle. And the breadth of the door was ten cubits. That's a pretty good door. And uh, the sides of the door were five cubits on the one side and five cubits on the other side. And he measured the length thereof, forty cubits, the breadth, twenty cubits. Ooh. And he went in, then went he inward and measured the post of the door, two cubits, the door, six cubits, the breadth of the door, seven cubits. And he measured the length thereof, twenty cubits, breath 20 cubits before the temple. And he said to me, this is the most holy place. Notice that his tour guide is making the measurements here. So you get the impression that Ezekiel is watching from the outside and he's telling you what the measurements are. Interesting. And uh, these dimensions are this, of these two apartments are the same as Solomon's temple. After he measured the wall of the house, six cubits, the breadth every side chamber, four cubits, round the house on every side. The side chambers were three, one over another, and thirty in order. 
And they entered into the wall which was of the house for the side chambers round about that they might have hold, but they had not hold in the wall of the house. And there was an enlarging and a, wind, and a winding about still upward to the side chambers for the winding about of the house went still upward round about the house. Therefore, the breadth of the house was still upward, so increased from the lowest chamber to the highest. If you, and, and it generally, most people see it as a three-story structure there. I also saw the height of the house round about. The foundation of the side chambers were a full reed of six cu great cubits. The thickness of the wall, which was for the side chamber without, was five cubits, and that which was left was the place of the side chambers that were within. And between the chambers was the wideness of twenty cubits round about the house on every side. The doors of the side chambers were toward the place that was left, the one door toward the north, another door toward the south, and the breadth of the place was left was five cubits round about. Now the building that was before the separate place at the end toward the west was 70 cubits broad, and the wall of the building was five cubits thick round about, and the length thereof 90 cubits. Now put your minds at ease, this is not, none of these dimensions are on the final exam, okay? But I think we need, to, I've committed to going verse by verse as an pr approach, but also I think what I want to get across is this is very specific, very tangible, very real. But um, there is a uh, issue here a thing called the separate place. The separate place. And the word is in the um, Hebrew is Gizra. And the word Gizra is very um, enigmatic as to what it refers to. There's reason to, to, to see it used as a place that's reserved for repair or polishing or maintenance support. Like any like any um, hotel or something, there are rooms set aside for maintenance, for heating, for for the tool, for the guys with the tools to fix things that are broken, all that sort of thing. It may be that simple, but there's another part of the debate, not only about the gizra, because it's going to show up again and again. Is it the building or is it the space that the building faces? It turns out that behind Solomon's temple, most of the scholars that we've my wife and I have searched like crazy on this whole topic. We searched the, the, the um, Rockefeller Library in Jerusalem, and it's amazing as you get into all this stuff, the people who are experts have no idea, they have no idea what this is, and they're not even correct about where, what designates it exactly. But what we've discovered is that behind Solomon's Temple there was a similar space, by the way, but just as enigmatic. We're not sure what it was really used for either. But uh, in this Millennial Temple, it's this space up here on the west side. That's the back side. East is at the bottom here. It's on the back side. And, there's a and most scholars jump to the conclusion that there's this strange building, labeled B, building, not explained here on this diagram, that that's the Gizra. And yet, if you examine the Hebrew carefully, you'll discover that that building faces the separate place. The separate place is a space a very sizable space that it's facing. And what it's used for is one of strict speculation because it's not mentioned. Uh, so far we haven't even been able to see a hints by the Holy Spirit as to what that really, uh, um, uh, its purpose might be. And uh, so uh, many people assume it's the building. If you examine the Hebrew carefully, it is the space that the building faces. The only, uh, the only uh, commentator that picks up on that is Matthew Henry, but then he doesn't run with it. He goes on about other issues. So, anyway, moving on here, verse 12. Now the building that was before the separate place at the end toward the west was 70 cubits broad, and the wall of the building was 5 cubits thick round about, and the length thereof was 90 cubits. Again, the separate place is prominent here. And again, by the way, the, uh, the, the Hebrew grammar implies that it's this the building that was before the separate place. See, the point is the building isn't the separate place, it's the building that's facing the separate place. Follow me? That's what the Hebrew implies. The building is Binyan, that's behind the temple. And its purpose is not explained. It's a large building, 90 by 70 cubits. It's a huge building. With walls five cubits thick, behind or on the west side of the temple. Facing the temple yard, or separate place, which is the Gizra. What's the Gizra for? Not sure, it's just a separate place. So he measured the house 100 cubits long in a separate place in the building, and the wall. there again, the, the, the house 100 cubits long, and the separate place, and the building with the walls thereof 100 cubits long. 
On the west or back of the temple, there was a separate place occupied by buildings of the same external dimensions as the temple. That is, 100 cubits square in the entire compass. So, you know, it's, visualize that at 150 foot by 150. You know, it's half a football field. Now, the purpose is not explained. So, they're left, we left to speculate on that. And the breadth of the face of the house, and of the, again, the separate place toward the east, 100 cubits. And he measured the length of the building over and against the separate place, which was behind it, and the galleries thereof on the one side and on the other side, 100 cubits, with the inner temple and the porches of the court. The doorposts, the narrow windows, the galleries round about on their three, on their three stories, there it is again, uh, over against the doors, uh, sealed with the wood round about and from the ground up to the windows, and the windows were covered. That above the door, even unto the inner house and without, and by all the wall round within and without by measure, it was made with cherubim and, and uh, palm trees, so that the palm tree was between a cherub and a cherub, and every cherub had two faces. So that the face of a man was toward the palm tree on the one side, the face of the young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. It was made through all the house round about. A lot of commentators point out that cherubs, we don't have four faces, but you can't render four faces on a, in, a, in a relief. So you only can pick, you know, pick two. See? From the ground unto the, above the door were cherubim and palm trees made and on the wall of the temple and the posts of the temple were squared and the face of the sanctuary um, uh, and the appearance of the one was the appearance of the other, and the, wall, the altar of wood was three cubits high, and length thereof two cubits, and the corners thereof, the length thereof, the walls thereof, were of wood, not wood covered with gold, it's three good apparently, and he said unto them, this is the table as before the Lord. We're talking about the table, the altar of incense here, not the, not, don't confuse that with the brazen altar that's in the outer court. And the temple and the sanctuary had two doors. The doors had two leaves, a priest, uh, two turning leaves, two leaves for one door and two leaves for the other door. And they were made on them and the doors of the temple, cherubim and palm trees like as were made upon the walls and there were thick planks upon the face of the porch without and there were narrow windows and palm trees on one side and on the other side and on the sides of the porch and upon the side chambers of the house and thick planks. Whew. Now we're into the priest chambers. Well, the, the, the short little chapter left here. Appreciate it. Then he brought me forth into the outer, outer court and uh, the, the way toward the north, and he brought me into the chamber that was over and against the separate place, and uh, which was before the building toward the north. Uh, before the length of a hundred cubits was the north door, the breadth was fifty cubits, over and against the twenty cubits which were for the inner court, and over and against the pavement which was for the out, uh, outer court. Uh, was the gallery against the gallery in three stories. And before the chambers was a walk of ten cubits breadth inward, a walk of one cubit, and the doors toward the north. Now the upper chambers were shorter, for the galleries were higher than these, than the lower, and, and than the middle most of the building. And they were in three stories, but had not pillars as the pillars of the courts. Therefore the building was straightened more than the lowest and middlemost, middlemost from the ground. And the wall was without, over, and against the chambers toward the outer court on the fore part of the chambers. The length thereof was 50 cubits. The length of the chambers were in the outer court were 50 cubits. And lo, before the temple were 100 cubits. And from under these chambers was the entry on the east side that goeth unto them from the outer court. The chambers were in the thickness of the wall, the court toward the east, over and against the separate place, over against the building. There's a separate place again. And, and the way before them was like the appearance of the chambers which were toward the north, as long as they and as broad as they and all their goings out were both according to their fashions, according to their doors. And according to the doors of the chambers that were toward the south was a door at the head of the way, even the way directly before the wall toward the east, as one entereth them. Well, we're almost there. Then said he unto me, The north chambers and the south chambers which were before the separate place, they be holy chambers. Where the priests that approach unto the Lord shall eat the most holy things, there shall they lay most holy things, and the meat offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. When the priests enter therein, then shall they not go out of the holy place unto the utter court, but they, there they shall lay their garments wherein they minister, for they are holy, and shall put on other garments, and shall approach to those things which are for the people. Now when he had made an end of measuring the inner house, he brought me forth toward the gate whose prospect is toward the east and measured it round about. And he measured the east side with a measuring reed, 500 reeds with a measuring reed round about. And he measured the north side, 500 reeds with a measuring reed round about. He measured the south side, 500 reeds with a measuring reed. 
and he turned about to the west side and measured 500 reeds and with the measuring reed. And he measured by the four sides. It had a wall round about it, 500 reeds long and 500 broad to make a separation between the sanctuary and the profane place. Interesting. Okay. Well, now you've got a whole bunch of difficulties here. There's all, I know we've waded through a lot of architectural detail here. Buried in all this are a lot of problems. The rabbis of the Talmud remark that only the prophet Elijah who will herald the ultimate redemption will elucidate the discrepancies with the Torah laws and the terms which do not occur elsewhere. There's all kinds of things here that is in violation of the Torah. So they, the, the, the Talmudic rabbis say, well, Elijah, when he comes, is going to straighten that all out. Okay. The Babylonian Talmud has a similar problem. They said, had it not been for Rabbi Kanina ben Hezekiah, who explained away several of these difficulties, the book of Ezekiel would have been excluded from the canon of Scripture. In other words, we sort of bog down in all the detail. But the more you know about the Levitical practices, you discover all kinds of problems in terms of what they're wearing and how they wear it. And there's a whole bunch of contradictions with Levitical practice. So much so, it almost didn't make it in the canon. But this rabbi found a way to argue around that, which got it in the canon. The truth of the matter is, the real answer isn't that. The real answer shows up in the epistle to the Hebrews. It isn't Levitical. We're not talking about a Levitical priesthood. Melchizedek is the, is the priesthood. So there's a whole other issue here that isn't addressed uh, by them for obvious reasons. But the, the, there's still difficulties. You know, are these details of this vision meant to be actualized some future date? I believe it is. What part will the bloody sacrifices play in the future economy? Who knows? Will the Zedekite priesthood without high priest function again? That's what it says. Who is the prince? And who are his sons? There's a... We haven't gotten into the land layout, but there's a prince. Doesn't speak of the king, it speaks of the prince. And he has sons. Well, who is he? Is that David? And what's going on here? And who are the downgraded Levites in chapter 44? And what about the uncircumcised foreigners excluded from the sanctuary in chapter 44? And the resident aliens who receive property in 47. All kinds of issues here. And what about the geographical problems? Here there's, there's, there's a stream coming out of the temple and then going in two different directions. We'll show you that next time on a map. And what about the apportionment of the land among the 12 tribes? How are you going to explain all that? Dan, who is not sealed in Revelation 7, is the first to inherit the land. Well, it's first because they go from north to south and listing it, but okay. But there's a bigger problem. The geography requires over 50 miles wide. So in the next session, we're going to explore the ministries of the temple, or through the tedious archite arch you know, uh, architectural detailing, and uh, we'll, re we'll review that in summary form with the diagrams next time. I won't take the time tonight again. We'll go through those again in broad brush. But then deal with the ministries of the temple. So for next time, read... Three more chapters, 43, 44, and 45. And I'm, I'm not saying we're going to get through all of them next time, but you know, as, you, as we're working our way through, 48 40 is, the, is, is the climax. So praise God for that. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer.